you've joined me before, you know I often have a special guest. Today's guest is Chris Dawson from Veracore. They are a collections agency and a darn good one at that. Chris has bailed me out of some tight situations and I wanted to share with you guys uh, not only his contact info, but some good advice. So he's going to give us some great advice about how to do collections and how to get more cash into your business. And uh, Chris, what what did you learn about collections from your uh, undergraduate degree in the Virginia Commonwealth University? <laughs> well, m- much like anyone that went to uh, school or law school, uh, didn't teach us a second about collections. Uh, <laughs> not something that is taught. They don't have any college courses. Uh, They don't teach it in accounting. They don't teach it in law school, business management. It's just just something that you you just have to do and and hope that you learn uh, the right practices from the right people. Awesome. Awesome, Bridge. So you've you've introduced us to, I've got three steps to minimize bad debt. And uh, I think we actually came up with a bonus one. So stick with us, folks. We've got a couple bonuses. But tell us about these three, and I'll, I've got a slide on each of them for you. If you're, when you're ready, you tell me. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, the, the, the three that will help you is, is up front, you want to scrub them. You want to scrub them thoroughly. You want to make sure you know who you're about to get into this business relationship with. Uh, once you've established that they are worthy, uh, you want to follow up regularly. You want to have, uh, best business practices in place um, to set the tone and to um, keep yourself informed if things start to go wrong. Yeah, sideways. And then uh, communication is always key, especially when you're communicating something other than pleasantries. Uh, you want to communicate consequences. There, There is actually uh, accountability when you're doing business with uh, you. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, we didn't say it, but we're talking about customers here, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, 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 the customers that uh, want to make you their vendor. That's uh, right. People that want to buy your widgets, buy your accounting expertise, your CFO expertise, uh, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so you talked about scrubbing your customers. How, what does that mean? You want to have a credit application. You and want and to have there's, some, there's, there's plenty of uh, situations where you're lending, where you're doing business with a consumer, but you are taking a credit app, right? I mean, well, yeah, sure. I guess you're lending them money, uh, yeah, I can you know, them. renting them equipment, big stuff like that. You know, not not day to day rentals. I, I That's guess. right. But but rent an apartment, buy a washer dryer, put it on credit terms, uh, whatever it is. If it, this applies to consumers as well as businesses. That's true. Very yeah. true. So you you want to get. Uh, pertinent information. You know, what, what is the name of the business? Um, are they incorporated? Uh, what is the physical address? I see many credit applications where the address is a PO box. That's a sign, you mm. know, ask them if they put a PO box in there, what is your physical address? That's a sign. It's law of large numbers. You can't say words like every and never and guaranteed and things like that in the collections world. But law of large numbers, if they don't have a physical address, that's a bad sign. You want to know who the owners are, not just the accounts payable person. Uh, you want to know who are their current vendors that will say good things about them. That's typically who they will put on the credit application. They're certainly not going to put a vendor on the credit application that they're not paying. and want to put the vendors on there that they are paying. Uh, check that info out. Uh, who is their bank? Um, that is information that you can actually use as a first party collector if you're doing your own work before you send it to an agency. But if you have the right third party entity doing work for you, they will leverage that information as well on the back end. Yeah. Tell me a little bit. Of, if I know that that you I'm, I'm getting ready to extend credit to you and I know that you work with John's Car Repair and that John's Car Repair has given you $50,000 of credit. You put that on my credit application. And I know that you bank at Bank of America and you've got a half a million. You tell me you've got a half a million dollars in a checking account. What can I do with that information? Can I call John's Car Repair or can I call Bank of America to verify? Can I get a account balance or a number of times you've bounced a check or what do I do with that? Well, Um, When it comes to vendors, uh, you certainly want to call and verify that they are a customer. You want to verify what their pay uh, history is. Much like banks, some vendors will respond, other vendors won't. When it comes to bank info, 
Uh, same sort of thing. Some banks play, some banks don't. But uh, some banks will verify uh, your account balance. Uh, some banks will verify, hey, I got a $50,000 check, just want to call and make sure that check is good. They will let you know. On the front end, the, the, the fact that you get hard information is most important. Whereas on the back end, when we as an agency are, are leveraging that information, we're more of a smoke and mirrors type of thing because when, when we are reaching out to that vendor or we are reaching out to that bank, the, the key to that particular, we call them inquiries or tools, the key to that having impact is just the debtor knows that you're doing. It. Okay. If they don't know that you're doing it, it does not apply any pressure. Uh, we right. as a third party entity trying to collect money, when we get the file, it's because they don't get on the phone. They're not answering the phone. They're not responding to your email. So no one can collect from anyone that doesn't come to the table. So how do you get them to come to the table? For lack of a better term, you freak them out. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you do reach out to their vendors because they don't want you, a collection agency, reaching out to their, va their favorite vendor. Uh, they sell widgets. They don't want you reaching out to the widget manufacturer as a collection agency. Yeah. Because the widget manufacturer might think, there's trouble on the horizon. Maybe we ought to pump the brakes with these guys. So that's how we leverage the information. Okay. As a first party entity, I suggest strongly that you use that info. I've seen on credit applications, uh, a potential customer use, you know, uh, their gas station as uh, a, that's not a vendor, you know, <laughs> you, you pay for your gas up front. That, that doesn't, provide those that are extending credit any level of comfort that, right. oh, you pay your bills on time. No, I just yeah. need you pay your gas up front, you know? Right. So uh, that's how you can use the info. That's how we use the info. Okay. So talk about the last two points, then terms and conditions and personal guarantee. We, we were mentioning Perfect. that the, the SBA loans have personal guarantees on them. How, how do you, what do you do with that in a commercial setting? All right. So the, the terms and conditions are basically you establishing the rules before the game begins. So you have, you are net 30. If you don't pay, you will have one and a half percent per month, 18% per year, whatever is allowed in your particular state as a late fee. Uh, if we have to go and get third-party assistance, you will pay collection fees and attorney fees. You state those sorts of things. So that, that again, that will help you down the road if it goes bad, to collect that extra money or to use it as leverage. Some people have no intention of assessing late fee. That's like never punishing your kids. You know, <laughs> if you don't hold them accountable, if there are no circumstances or consequences for their behavior that is not right, they will continue with the bad behavior. Yeah. Uh, so assess those fees. Use them as leverage. You, you can knock them off at the end if they pay the bill. I don't suggest it, but you can do whatever you want. It's your money. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to personal guarantees, you got to be crazy to sign one. But if they do sign it, um, that means that they are personally responsible for the debt, despite the fact they set up an S Corp, a C Corp, or an LLC. Just from experience, having been in the industry for 20 years, a personal guarantee is only going to help you if the person has something to lose. If you have a personal guarantee on the owner of a business that is out of business, almost always they're broke. Yeah. They went down. So it's not going to really give you the leverage to compel a broke person to pay a bill. Yeah. A personal guarantee is going to work when they do have something to lose. And this might be a good place to say that uh, laws vary from state to state, both on what you can what you can require in your terms and conditions and on what you can enforce in the courts afterwards, right? A lot of nuance. Courts, there. <laughs> quite frankly, aren't even enforcing the law anymore. So you know, there, there's an impression out there that I encounter on a daily basis that if I sue a company and win, I'm going to get paid. Uh, that is almost always not the case. Wow. Um, 
you know, if you have to sue a company to get paid, that's saying a lot. Uh, most companies that are continuing or plan to continue to do business that value their brand, that value their reputation, they're not going to let you sue them. They're yeah. going to come to the table. They're going to want to settle. So if the court date happens, the probability of you getting paid when you win that, typically it's a default judgment. They don't even show up for court. It's slim and none. It just doesn't work out the way most yeah. people think it's going to work. Yeah. Out. Yeah, good. All right. Well, thank you for that. Let's talk. Uh, so that's before you started doing business with them, right? You've scrubbed this customer. You've got a written agreement with them. You've got terms and conditions that they've accepted. You know who they are. You know who their other vendors are. So you can follow up and whammy them if you have to. <laughs> so now you've done business with them and you send their first invoice and then what? Yeah. So we think it's very important that you follow up the first invoice and quite frankly, every invoice, if you have the resource to do so, call them 10 days, make sure they got the invoice. Um, it, it, am I sending it to the right person? Oh no, I didn't get the invoice. Well, where should I be sending it? Get, get that straight right away. Yeah. Um, are there any issues? Are there any disputes? Uh, one of the things that we run into most frequently is it's a dispute. And what's worse is our client didn't know it was a dispute. Yeah. Or even worser <laughs> is uh, it was a dispute. They knew about it and did nothing to rectify it nor document any of the issues. Yeah. So that documentation is most important, but yeah. find out if there's a dispute so you can handle that dispute. You can resolve that dispute immediately. And, and but particularly, particularly yeah, particularly when there's not a dispute, though, this this whole idea of squeaky wheel gets the grease, I think, is just is so important because it's so easy for people to ig just ignore you and, and not saying they're bad people. They're not complaining about their bill, but they just ignore you. Some people just don't pay their bills. And and I, I love your idea of starting to call it 10 days because it's surprising how often the communication goes into your junk folder, your spam folder, whatever, it goes completely off the rails from the very beginning, right? But it seems like you just got to be the squeaky wheel. You need to be the squeaky wheel, and it, and it sends a message because, I mean, th there are 4,000 collection agencies out there. Oh, God. Okay. All right, that's just in the U.S., <laughs> and there are 4,000 collection agencies out there for a reason, and the reason is, is most businesses are not squeaky. Yeah. Um, they don't do these things. Uh, if they did, there would not be 4,000 collection agencies. You know, I mean, we're, we're busy people. Yeah. Uh, we've been around for 20 years. So it, it, it sends a message that you mean business. It sends a message that you expect to get paid for what I would imagine uh, all the, the people that are watching this uh, webinar is, you know, the, the best of the best of whatever they're providing. You yeah. know, I got the best scuba gear. Um, out there in Washington, I got the best accounting. So you are providing the, the, the best of the best of whatever you're providing. So you expect to be compensated. I, I heard, you know, you hear collectors talking and one of the things we hear quite frequently is um, you, you're not paying your bill and the, the, the debtor will say, well, I've been doing business with them for seven years. Okay, you know, you, you pay for something and they provided something in return. Uh, it, it's kind of like if, if you're married, if you were faithful to your spouse for seven years and then you weren't, do you think your spouse would be okay with, well, I've been faithful to you for seven years. So, you know, it, it just doesn't work that way. But, but, but they think they do or mm -hmm. that it does. So let them know that you mean business. Let them know when the date, you know, the payment is due. And let them know what the consequences are if, if they don't pay. And awesome. of course, do it in the most professional and kind manner that you can. Yeah. So you mentioned consequences, and that's your next uh, your next point is to to not just have it down in writing, right? We wrote down the consequences when we specified our terms and conditions and we had our credit application at the very beginning. But doesn't do any good to write it down if you don't actually enforce it or or do those things that you promised, right? Amen. So th th those are great consequences. Obviously, put them on hold. You're, you're not getting anything else on credit until you pay the balance of full plus the fees. Late fees are mentioned. Certainly assess those late fees. Expect them. Speak them. Let them know that they exist. Uh, let them see them each month on their on their statement. 
Uh, I have a lot of clients that I'll, I'll get a I'll get a statement with no late fees and they haven't paid in a year. And I ask them, hey, your credit app says you have late fees. You want to assess those late fees. And so they they pile them on at the end when, it, I, I, you know, possibly if you'd have done it each month and the debtor saw that, maybe that would have created a different uh, result. Who knows? Um, and then do call those references. But more importantly than calling the debtor references, let them know that you're calling. Yeah. If you send an email, copy that that entity that owes you on that email so they know what you're doing. Because if you do it and they don't know you're doing it, it does not apply pressure. Is, is there any blanket statement you can make about what's legal for me to say to your other vendor about your behavior and about your payment? Can I just write to John's Body Shop and say, man, Chris Dawson has not paid me for six months. He owes me $700,000. Uh, I can't get him to call me back. He's a real screwball. I hate his haircut. And, uh, you know, he told me I was, whatever. Can I say anything I want? Well, I wouldn't call him a screw a screwball. He didn't use his haircut. That could be liable. Maybe the guy has a great haircut <laughs> and he's, he's not a screwball. But you, you can stick to the facts. Yeah. Hey, I have some concerns. And, and look, when, when they sign that credit app, if you have the right terms and conditions, it says that you have the right to reach out to those vendors. Yeah. He says, I, I agree. You know, you're saying I, I can investigate you when you, yeah. you do a credit app. So, yeah. Hey, ABC Incorporated, I'm having trouble with XYZ Incorporated. They owe me three quarters of a million bucks. They have for six months. What can you tell me? Are you experiencing the same thing? That's yeah. that's cool. Let's go back to the, the credit app for just a second, because it occurs to me, is, is there any place where you can cross-check these people? I mean, Dun & Bradstreet comes to mind, right? DNB claims to have the credit history of every business on the face of the earth, and, and they make me pay, <laughs> they ask me to pay lots of money to keep my credit clean and accurate and all that stuff. Is it any, does it do any good at all to go look up your guy on, on DNB and see whether he has a payment history that you can find out there? Well, Yes. All right. So in my opinion, knowledge is power. Um, we, we, have, we, we have a tool that can help our clients on the front end. I mean, we're, we're only telling our clients if we have seen them before. So going back to we're one of 4,000 collection agencies, if we have not seen them before, we're never a reason for a yes. But let's say we have seen them before. Again, we're one of 4,000 collection agencies. So if you haven't seen them, it's not saying anything. If yeah. you have, if Veracore has seen them, it's saying a lot. Yeah. So that would be a reason to be hesitant. Now, when it comes to DNB, uh, it, again, information is power, but I have a, a, a good DNB story for you. Um, we, our, our president is, uh, is Tim Sanderson. He worked for what is commonly known as the very first commercial collection agency ever. It started across the lake in New Orleans. It was called Milliken and Michael. His uncle was the owner and it was a big agency. Very, very successful. Uh, his uncle lives on the river now with Italian marble and never work a day in his life again. <laughs> but the mayor of New Orleans sent a letter to Milliken and Michael uh, because they wanted to throw some kind of celebration or whatever for Milliken and Michael in New Orleans. So Mike was curious, like, what, what the heck would they want to do that for? So he called the mayor's office. And the mayor's office says, well, you know, uh, we called DMB, you know, we noticed on DMB that you're doing some ridiculous number in revenue and all this stuff. And Mike started laughing. He says, <laughs> He says, yeah. He says, one of those DMB guys called me and I just answered a bunch of questions with <laughs> untruths. So, so to me, DMB does have very good information. I think it's a valuable tool, but it's also the equivalent of a Wikipedia. All right. Yeah. They're going to report anything you tell them as fact. They're, yeah. they're not, they're not checking on, on what businesses are self-reporting on themselves. Right. So, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. I think that many times when you're looking at credit applications, there are little signs that you can pick up on that should uh, give you a red flag. 
Uh, number one, cross-reference the area code with the physical address. I can't tell you how many times uh, I get a phone number for a debtor. The state is Virginia and the physical address is Minnesota. Uh, that's a sign. Um, same, I mentioned the PO box. Uh, look at their emails. You would not believe some email addresses that people use to conduct business. It's, you know, cities email addresses that belong on shady websites. It, <laughs> but, but seriously, it, that, that, you know, that, that stuff that is passed along to us, uh, this is the email that this guy is doing business with. And right away I'm thinking, and you did business with them. Yeah. It's, it just amazes me. So there's a lot of things that you can glean from a credit app just on the surface without doing any kind of research. Yeah, right. um, Google is your friend with a credit app. Like, <laughs> yeah, or duck, duck, go, whatever one you use, you know. Yeah. All right. So let's now assume that uh, you've, you've been the squeaky, you've had a credit app, you've done everything right, you've communicated, you've been the squeaky wheel, you've tried to enforce the uh, late fees and all this stuff, and it still doesn't work. I call you, right? I say, Chris, I'm not getting any love from this guy anymore. And you're going to ask me, what kind of documentation do you have? Because I, I know you're going to ask me that because you have asked me that. <laughs> right. Well, it, one of the keys to success on the on the first party side, which is you're doing your own collections, and on the third party side, which is us, the you know whether it's a, an agency, an attorney that's doing the work for you, is you got to know the story. Um, the the key to us having success is simply overcoming objections and making the debtor own the bill. They got to own the debt. Yeah. So if there's no documentation, uh, you, the first party person, can't tell me the story. And even worse, you, the first party person, don't know what's been going on for the previous 30, 60, 90, 120 plus days. So how do you know if that company is exhibiting the characteristics of a company that's going down? Um, so you, you need to document those things. Each attempt, what number are you calling? What you know, last four digits is typically enough for you to know where you're calling. You know, if you call David, you're going to get thanks for calling Fuse or DIY CFO. If you call Veracore, thank you for calling Veracore. So it's a sign when you call what you think is a business number and it does not identify a business. Yeah. That's a sign. What's even worse is if the voicemail is full. Put that in your notes. Law of large numbers, if a voicemail is full for a business, that means more people are calling them to get money than to give them money. Yeah. And that's a bad sign. Yeah. Um, dispute resolution, the, the dispute has to be to the T. And then most importantly, does the dispute have any credence? And why doesn't it? Because as a third-party agency or anybody, an attorney, anybody that's working this file for you, they're going to hear the same thing you heard. And if they don't know what you heard, they got to go back to you and see how you answer that. But if you, if you as a third-party entity know what the dispute is, know what the objection is, and know how to overcome it, hey, look, we know the client heard your dispute. We know that it carries no water because of this. Why aren't you paying? Let, let's really truly talk about why you're not paying, right? So that's most important. And quite frankly, it's it's what I see is one of the biggest weaknesses out there is, yeah. you know, documentation of disputes and a willingness to handle it. You know, a lot of people don't like conflict resolution. They just don't. Yeah, they just don't and, like uh, conflict. And it shows. <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, that's a that's an awesome set of tips, Chris. Um, we do have some questions on the Q&A. Before we do that, I want to present oh. one more slide. Oh. And that is how to how to run your business without Chris. <laughs> so we don't have to call a collections agency. And to kind of uh, bookend my conversation, you know, I, I said at the beginning that I met Chris through uh, what was not a very good year. 2018, I lost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to bad debt. And Chris helped bail me out of some of that, but uh, but it was a rough year. And, you know, something like 20% of my revenues were just not paid by people who were disputing it, who were going out of business, who were lazy, whatever the reasons were. And so after Chris bailed me out, uh, I said, you know, I got to change the root cause here. I got to refigure my business model so that I'm not 
waiting six months to get paid and then calling Chris and paying him a percentage of the finder's fee. And finally, a year later, I get a little trickle out of what was a uh, what was a giant waterfall. So the way I changed was to accept credit cards, to require prepayments, and to do uh, ACH. So I don't know if everyone knows what ACH is. It actually stands for the American Clearing House. It's a financial institution. But uh, you can use the banking routing numbers and bank account number for any bank account in the United States, at least. And you can withdraw money from that bank account if you have that much information. And legally, if you have the written permission of the bank account owner. So today, when you become my client, I ask you to sign my proposal, right? So it says what work we're going to do. I ask you to sign my terms and conditions, which are all those things that Chris mentioned at the beginning about uh, late fees and timeliness of payments and how to, how to object to the work that I do. If you don't think I'm doing a good job, there's ways for you to object. And then uh, the final third page that I ask you to sign is an ACH authorization form. And that just says, I'm going to present to you my invoice at the end of the month. If you have no objections, then 10 days later, I'm going to pull that money out of the bank. If you have an objection, you better call me before 10 days are up because otherwise I've got your money and it might be hard to get it back for me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, ACH is a, what I think is an amazing, uh, amazing way to do business with other folks. And it's cheaper than somebody mailing a check, licking a stamp, putting it in an envelope. Do you know that uh, maybe you know a, a better figure for this, Chris, but when I was last looking at this, what it costs the company owner to receive an invoice by PDF or, or in the mail to then get out his paper checkbook to write a check, tear it off, record it, record it here, record it there, put it in an envelope, lick a stamp, lick the envelope, write the address, do the whole damn thing, put it in the mail, stop what he's doing and walk to the mailbox. It costs something like $75 to pay a bill. <laughs> to pay a bill for some companies. And, you know, that's just crazy. I, I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating at 75 bucks, but even if ACH you- ACH is free. ACH is almost free. Uh, um, some it's places- free for us. Is it free we do it every day. Yeah. I and think- that, That's our preferred method. Be, and look, ACH also means that they're not putting it in the mail. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're seeing the checks we send to, send to clients take a week to two weeks now sometimes to get to our clients. Yeah. So we- we ask our clients, let's get on ACH. That way, when we're sending you your money, you get it next day. You don't yeah. have to wait a week to two weeks. That's right. And it's, we it's don't kind of, incur that expense you're talking about. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like a wire, but it's a lot cheaper than a wire, right? Yeah. Wires to be 15 or 20 or 30 bucks ACH. Oh, yeah. um, I think Intuit QuickBooks charges you a dollar for an ACH in some oh, cases. Okay. Might, might be 50 cents if you sign up for their services. But right. anyway. All right. That's awesome. Well, let's... let's um, so those are alternatives. When you when you implement this kind of cash based system, hopefully it reduces your accounts receivable. It reduces your bad debt. It reduces the reasons you got to call Chris. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's talk about some questions here. So Lynn has a question for you, Chris. She says, "I don't think DNB does squat for construction companies, but there is a reporting agency designed just for construction, and I can't remember the name. Have you ever seen a?" Uh, a DNB like entity that works for construction companies. I can ask, yeah. and then you know get, get an answer. Yeah, uh, it'd be interesting to know if there's any agencies that do what DNB is supposed to be doing. Right? We think of DNB as a credit reporting and credit scoring agency. Totally understand your explanation why maybe they're not so reliable, but it seem does seem like somebody ought to be doing that, right? Well, yeah, I mean, but it, it's it's up to it's up to those that are extending credit to do the reporting, right? I mean, a lot a lot of people that uh, I have a lot of customers that say, "Hey, are you going to report on their credit bureau?" Well, number one, you can't report on their consumer because it's a commercial debt, so you can't touch their personal credit. Mm. But even then, we we don't report to any of the commercial because we did a long time ago. And most importantly, it never compels anyone to pay. Yeah. Number two, it creates a boatload of headaches for us. You know, maybe our client goofed up. They weren't really that late. Oh, now we got to go correct it. Or, you know, five years later, they paid the bill and it's still there. And they, we got to correct it. So it, 
most importantly, it doesn't compel anyone to pay, and then it just created a lot of headaches for us. But uh, Lynn, you'll have her info, right, David? Sure. Yeah, Lynn, I can. All right, uh, so what I'll do is I'll just I'll send you the answer, and okay. then you can forward it to Lynn. All right. And awesome. uh, so uh, share. Sorry, Stacy. Stacy Grindstaff, Thank you for your question. Stacy asks, "What is the best way to handle customers?" who have credit terms of net 30, but are beginning to extend payments into the 45 and 60 day timeframe. These major corporation, these are major corporations doing this to keep their cash for additional day, days to gain a small interest on their money before paying, paying their vendors. What is the best way to assess an additional percentage and a half per month in fees or separate invoices or to se separate invoices or reflected on the original invoice that is unpaid and delayed? So what is the best way to assess the additional late fee per month? Should I, oh, okay. So that's the core of her question. First of all, any, any best practices to collect from big companies? And then secondarily, if you have late fees that are going to be assessed, do you show that on the invoice that you send on day one or do you send a separate invoice later? Well, it's not late on day one. So you, you certainly want to wait till, if, it, if it's net 30, day 31 is when you're going to assess those late fees. Uh, so typically, you will, uh, the, the invoice goes out on day two, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, it's got net 30. So on net 31, if they haven't paid, uh, I would send out an invoice that shows that you assessed the uh, late fees. Or uh, if, you, if you send a statement with invoices, just have it on there. Um, so the best way to assess it is just to assess it. Uh, you, you can pick what document you want to put it on. Just make sure kind of back to the day 10 thing that whatever you're sending out is going to the right destination, uh, a real decision maker and or the accounts payable department is receiving that document. You know, you're talking about major corporations. Um, a lot of companies value those major corporations because they represent major money, a major percentage of their total business. So they don't want to hurt their feelings, you know, tick them off. So they, they don't assess that stuff. So you as a business owner or CFO or whatever capacity you have, you know, it's certainly up to you to risk the reward. Is the potential of ticking some major corporation off worth one and a half percent a month? Yeah. Look, I, it's out there. The, the, the Walmarts of the world, the government, you know, it's amazing. They can pay any bills being 26 trillion in debt, but they take forever to, to pay because they can, yeah. because they, they know that you're not going to do anything about it. They, they know that they represent a very good portion of your revenue. And if you lose them, you're losing a lot. So yeah. it, it's, it, it's a double-edged sword, but I'm a firm believer in accountability. Yeah. Hold them accountable. And I don't know whether I've ever actually seen a Walmart or a Dell or somebody pay late fees, even when they've been assessed, they, they might even agree to pay them. I'm not sure that I've ever seen them actually pay them when they're assessed. Um, uh, we, we had, we had one company tell us that their company policy was not to pay any invoices over six months old. And uh, <laughs> so, well, that's a great policy. You just, you just avoid the invoice for six months and then say that's against our policy to pay it. <laughs> so our response to that was obviously, you know, the, 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 the courts in your area don't really give a hoot about your policy. Yeah. Uh, your policy is contrary to the law. So we're going to bury your policy. Uh, but you hear those stuff, you know, you, you got some companies that have some very creative policies yeah. and uh, it's up to you to challenge them. Lynn said, oh, Lynn, Lynn is the woman who asked about the other agency. She says she's used it before. Any, anybody who knows a construction agents, a construction industry credit reporting agency, uh, she would sure like to know. Well, Chris, uh, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Um, you know, collections is such a huge issue. If you don't collect the invoices, you don't get cash into your own business and you're setting yourself up to fail. So um, what, what's the saying? You guys have a saying if a, an invoice that hasn't been collected is a gift. <laughs> it's well, work, yeah. you don't get, work you don't get paid. I, for I, I got a couple, I got a couple of one liners. Oh, okay. Give it to uh, this is, you know, a lot of salespeople are the bane of collections basically, but uh, the only thing worse than no business is business doesn't pay. 
Oh, there you go. Okay. That's okay. one of them. Yeah. And, uh, and then the other, uh, one of the things or objections I hear from those that have debt that don't turn it over is I can't afford to lose that money, which is the fee that we get, you know, the percentage that we charge. <laughs> and the response to that is, is you can't lose something you don't have. Yeah. Uh, a little of something is better. Actually, most of something, because we're not taking most of it. We're, we yeah. take a small percentage, but most of something is better than all or nothing every yeah. day of the week. Yeah, that's right. So, D- you know, tell, those, those, tell, yeah, tell us how you how you work. So I send you a hundred thousand. I send you a thousand dollar invoice to collect from somebody. Hundred thousand. Let's stick with hundred thousand. Yeah, let's like stick that. with. <laughs> but you'll do any almost any size invoice, right? We absolutely. We've collected yeah. seven seven eight figure invoices down to. Two hundred fifty dollars invoice. Okay, so. so I send you a thousand dollars that I can't seem to get my customer to pay. Briefly, what do you do, and what do you charge me for that service? Well, you know, rates vary from customer to customer. TransUnion is my client. Okay, I, but I have all of the global TransUnion entities all over the planet. We collect everywhere, not just in the U.S. So they send us a boatload of business. They get a rate. They get a better rate than somebody that doesn't send that much business. Uh, it's also based on balance. So age, balance, volume is how you dictate rate. But standard standard rates typically right around 25%, somewhere around there, okay? So let's say somebody owes you a thousand bucks and you have a credit application and it has the right language. Um, so the laws are, uh, there are three states out there, the three ends, North Carolina, Nevada, North Dakota. Those state laws say that if the debtor is in that state, you cannot pursue collection fees. All right. So we're just going to go after the thousand bucks. Yeah. But in all the other states, if you have it in writing at 25%, we're not going after a thousand bucks. We're going after $1,333 and 33 cents. When the debtor pays that amount, we back out our 25%, 33, 33, 33. And you, the customer, walk to the bank with the original $1,000 as if it were free. So that is, that's the utopian collect. Yeah. We don't collect them all. Nobody does. And even on the ones that we do collect, they're not all free collects. Yeah. However, you know, if you send us enough business, you're going to have some that are 0% collects. You'll have some where the debtor wants to negotiate the rate. Well, okay. hey, can I just pay half the fees? So your rate goes from 25% to 12.5%. You net 87.5% of your money. Yeah. Other times the debtor is not going to pay any of the fees and you're just going to get 75% of your money. We as an agency, and quite frankly, every agency is this way. Uh, no matter what they pay, no matter who they pay, the agency is going to get their fee on what is paid when it's paid. So somebody owes you a thousand bucks, they only send you $250. The agency is going to keep 25% of the 250 and they're going to keep pursuing the other 750 because agencies are providing cash money, not widgets. So that, that stuff's due upon receipt. We agency expect those invoices to get paid right away because you're getting cash. And that's if the money goes to you. Uh, agencies tell all debtors to pay the agencies. Debtors pay who the heck they feel like paying. Yeah. So if they pay the customer, you know, you uh, let the agency know, hey, I got a payment for 250 bucks. Okay, we'll invoice you 25% of the 250 on Monday and we're going to act for the rest. So right. that, that's how that works. Cool. Um, Patricia asked if you serve clients all over the country. Do you have any geographic limitations? I, I have cl- I have a client out of uh, Taiwan. Oh, wow. Okay. Good for you. I, I have some international clients that have uh, domestic interests. Um, Cessna Aircraft is my client. Uh, we did such a great job in Europe for them that they hired us to do their European collections over the European agency that they were using. Wow. So yeah, we're everywhere. All right. Very good. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great month and call if we can help. David, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Chris. All right. Take care. Bye now.